Hi, everyone. I'm Eva Yazari. I'm the general partner of Beyond Capital Ventures. I'm also the author of The Good Your Money Can Do. Chris, I hope you have your book nearby as well. Oh, um, uh, you know, I don't have it immediately at hand. If you give me three seconds, I could get it. Grab it. I'll give All right, you I'll a be background on you while you get it. Um, I am here uh, with Chris Ye, and um, I'll introduce him in a minute. But the goal of this conversation is to talk about blitz scaling impact. Um, we are going to dive into some, some topics that center around our books um, and also talk about what blitz scaling is um, to begin with, but also you know, how to navigate the, every, every company's life cycle and all different life cycles of the company, but um, hopefully how to bring in both social and financial performance into that equation. So um, Chris, it's my pleasure to introduce you um, you are the co-author along with Reed Hoffman of Blitz Scaling. There you go. Voila. Thank you. Yes, it's a beautiful cover. Um, and it's a book that explains how to build world-changing companies like Amazon, Alibaba, Airbnb in record time. Um, I found it a fascinating read, um, especially because I'm investing in innovations and um, as a VC, a really great tool to have on hand. Um, and why, when I met you, I mean, I, I recognized you as a writer, an investor, as an entrepreneur, um, and I was fascinated by how you've had this ringside seat um, in, the, in the world of startups and, and scale-ups for a while, for, since 1995. Um, and I wanted to talk a little bit more about how this philosophy applies to impact, um, social impact, environmental impact. Um, stakeholder capitalism. But um, just to round out your background, um, you have your, your books in general help founders, venture capitalists, corporate leaders, policymakers, and everyday people, which is something I think is important to note. This is not just for you know, the Silicon Valley leaders of companies, it is for everyday people to understand how the internet has changed the way we work together to build amazing organizations. So thank you, Chris, for being here with me. My pleasure. And again, I'm really glad to be a part of this conversation because I don't think there's enough being talked about in terms of impact investing and its importance in the world. And so I'm glad to be a part of the discussion. Yes, no, I really, really appreciate that statement. Um, and I, I think actually maybe we could start there. Um, I mean, you know, as I mentioned, you've had this front row seat to the world of tech startups um, and you've seen technology be a tool for building businesses. Um, I would love if you can maybe just talk about blitz scaling, kind of give us a quick intro, but then quickly pivot into how you think impact can be brought into the equation, especially when it comes to tech. Absolutely. So we use blitz scaling to describe a philosophy of pursuing speed over efficiency. And what it basically means is you're going to sacrifice what we normally think of as efficiency and certainty in exchange for moving faster. And the question becomes, why would you want to do that? Well, in the business world, the reason is if you're going after a really valuable winner take most market, your goal should be to win the market. Then once you've won the market, you can print money and basically rake it in at your leisure. That's why there's trillion dollar companies roaming the landscape today. They're all blitz scalers that have won winner take most markets. You can look at Amazon and say, wow, Amazon is the leader in e-commerce, but also on the cloud. You can look at Google as the leader in search and online advertising, Facebook, social network and online advertising and so on and so forth. And so that really makes a lot of sense for the business world, which is why we say that it's the way that you build the world changing companies. But what's also true is that if you need to move quickly in the world of impact and social change, then blitz scaling is also relevant. Because everyone will tell you, as we look at the news, as we read articles, that the world desperately needs change, and it needs it fast. We don't have a lot of time to make some of the changes we need to have happen. And while I think it would be great if the average human consumer was willing to change their behavior, I don't think they're just going to do it on their own. Uh, I'm a big believer in the fact that human beings tend to be a little lazy, and it's hard for them to change their habits. And the best way to get them to change their behaviors is not to say, hey, for the good of the planet or your own long-term good, you need to do X, because I guarantee you they're not. It's to create new products, new services, new ways to displace the old 
that are more appealing to the consumer, but also are more sustainable and ultimately, hopefully, change the world for the better. And those are precisely the kinds of things that we need to blitz scale. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I want to remind anybody who's here live with us listening that this is also your time with Chris and myself. And you can ask any questions in the Q&A feature. Um, we are very, very happy to answer them for you. Um, but, you know, on the concept of needing to move quickly in the world of impact, um, the concept of blitzscaling prioritizes speed over efficiency. And so what do you think about that? I mean, impact is also a precious quality of a company. You know, you can't give somebody a better livelihood and then take it away because it hasn't been working. So what are your thoughts there, Chris? So we can think about one of the classic concepts that you know, Amazon has talked about, although they're not the first to come up with it, which is the concept of the flywheel. And the concept of the flywheel is that as you get it in motion, it becomes easier and easier to spin it. And that's why these businesses are so successful. Now you can apply the concept of the flywheel to money and making money. And it's fantastic and people have done that. Warren Buffett's own biography is actually called the snowball, for example, similar kind of thing. You get the snowball rolling down the hill, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. But then in the world of impact, the question becomes, are there also flywheels? Are there things whereby getting change to happen, we make it easier for more change to happen? So for example, Let's take the effort to get companies to start thinking about their carbon footprint and carbon impact. And it's hard to get them started because they're not used to it being a thing. But the more you get people to adopt the concept of carbon impact being a big issue and something that they're being measured on, the more it becomes a norm to actually worry about it and do something about it. And yeah, it's not going to proceed smoothly. And it's not like we've solved the problem. But I see movement in that direction as people are starting to say, well, you know, like I go on Google flights and when I look at the flights, it actually tells me how many kilograms of carbon dioxide is involved in that flight. It's an estimate, mm -hmm. right? It's not a perfect measure. It's an estimate, but now I can know, oh gee, you know, these flights look pretty same, similar, but if I take that flight, my carbon footprint is 20% less. I should probably take that flight. And the more these things become the defaults, these sort of behavioral nudges and norms, the more the flywheel accelerates. So I think that getting things going is a big deal. Getting things past that initial activation energy really makes a big difference. And that's where the concept of blitzscaling can help. This is where you and I, Chris, have something in common in that in my book, I write about the moral imperative for doing good. Um, but the moral imperative has an urgency. And the flywheel meets the need for that urgency. Um, we also love to invest in platform plays at Beyond Capital Ventures um, because of their ability to scale. Um, they just are able to connect markets, whether it's healthcare to the end patient, whether it's agriculture to the end market um, or a farmer's kind of livelihood to being able to sell their, their agricultural outputs. Um, and that's one of the core strategies of how we scale our social impact and have a high leverage effect on, on impact as well. But I, I love the fact that you thought about this. I was smiling because I think there's another book in you, perhaps uh, applying this, this concept to what the world really means. We do have one question, and I think it's a, an important question that centers around um, speed over efficiency means potentially making mistakes. So for all the type A's, all the perfectionists listening to this conversation or reading it, how do investors think about making mistakes and losing money? And this could be invest, investor perspective, founder perspective as a way yeah. to learn a market. Well, there's a couple of lenses on making mistakes that I'll offer up and, and they're not my lenses, they're lenses that other people have created, but I find them useful. The first is the venture capital lens. So both you and I are venture capitalists, we make investments Every time we make an investment, we think this company is going to succeed, or I really believe that this company is going to have a huge impact. And none of us make these investments thinking, yeah, this is 90% chance is going to fail. And yet the venture capital model is that 90% of the investments do not deliver a breakthrough result. And it's only through the fact that there's a portfolio, usually of 20 to 40 investments with a couple of them in there that really return the entire fund that the model works. And so in terms of thinking about making mistakes, if moving faster lets you get more bets on the table and you ultimately have a small number of those pay off, but pay off in a big way, that's one way to think about the lens of failure or the lens of making mistakes. 
The other lens on mistakes is something that Jeff Bezos has talked about. Jeff Bezos, of course, the founder of Amazon, recently stepped down as CEO, presumably to spend his time riding rockets into space. But one of the things that Jeff talked about is, is this a one-way door or a two-way door? In other words, we, if we do this and we discover it's a mistake, is it easy to just close the door, walk back into the previous room? When it's a one-way door, you have to really think about it carefully because you're like, okay, if I do this, there's no going back. And it has to be something that I feel comfortable with and I'm confident in. But if it's not a one-way door, if it's a two-way door, the bias should be, okay, as long as I believe that this is going to have a positive outcome, let's just do it because we can walk it back. Making a mistake that is a non-fatal mistake is acceptable if the willingness to make mistakes lets you go significantly faster. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that really resonates, especially in markets where they're actually, they have not been disrupted. There will be mistakes. And I actually know that the person who asked that question is trying to disrupt a new market. Um, and I think that that's you know, where his question has come from. Um, you famously have said, you help interesting people do interesting things. What an incredible way to view your career. I'm sure you're never bored and you're always always enthusiastic about it. Are there any common challenges that the, the founders and the entrepreneurs that you work with face and, and how do they blend in some of the stakeholder challenges as well? Well, one of the big challenges, and I think you touch on it when you talk about innovation, is whenever you try to do something new, that's something that people haven't done before, there's a lot of people who aren't going to believe in it. And that's something that every entrepreneur, whether they're a financial so, so software startup kind of entrepreneur or a social impact entrepreneur has to face. There is a chorus of voices saying, this is not going to work. This is not going to happen. And the funny thing is, those voices are technically correct because we just sort of said, well, there's a 90% chance it doesn't really work. And so, yeah, if you just say no to everything, you're going to be right 90% of the time, which is good enough to win you an A in school. But it also means that no progress would ever happen. And so the biggest issue is how do I persist in the face of people who are discouraging me? Well, at the same time, knowing as Kenny Rogers, the gambler said, when to fold them. Because you could spend your entire career focused on something. And maybe it just happens to be that success is around the corner, or maybe this is actually not a good idea because not everything works. And so balancing the persistence through criticism with the, with the ability to know, hey, now is the time to actually quit is a big challenge. And the way that I like to uh, frame it for people is to say, okay, when you get up in the morning, do a little inventory and ask yourself, do I still believe that this has a decent chance of succeeding? Once you've gotten to the point where you no longer believe it's going to succeed, if you don't believe it, certainly no one else is, and it probably is time to quit. There's no virtue in keeping going even when you no longer believe. But if you still believe and other people do not, then you may very well keep going. But please do try to be honest with yourself about whether or not you have a real chance. Absolutely. And when I mentioned stakeholders, um, you know, one of the the deeper concepts that is kind of embedded in impact is stakeholder capitalism. Um, it's the concept of, you know, servicing more than just your shareholders and your customers, servicing your, or, you know, being of service to your employees, um, your, the government, the community, the environment around you, um, being a servant leader. Um, and, and sometimes that can be harder. You know, it, there, there's more to think about. There's more, there are more individuals or concepts to integrate into your business. How, how have you worked with founders and entrepreneurs around that, that issue? So the stakeholder issue, I view it basically as a long-term issue versus a short-term focus, which is why it's hard to deal with on the, 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 the startup side. It's for startups, six months is long-term planning, right? The world changes for them so quickly that six months out is something they can barely even consider. But when I think about stakeholders and the importance of stakeholders, why are stakeholders so important? Well, there's a moral imperative, but it's also the case that they are critical to the long-term success of the company, right? Think about all the issues that big tech companies are running into right now with governments. One of the things we argue with blitzscaling is that responsible self-regulation is the best way to preempt heavy-handed government regulation. 
right? You should not be surprised if you decide that you are going to move fast, break things, and ask for uh, forgiveness rather than permission, then eventually somebody decides to put some rules on you. But if instead you behave in a responsible way and you go ahead and say, hey, here are steps that we're taking because we know it's the right thing to do and it's good for the long term, then it's much less likely that people are going to say, well, we got to focus on those people over there who are responsibly behaving themselves versus the vast majority of people who are irresponsibly growing at all costs. So I think that there's a, a real value to considering the stakeholders in advance. The final thing I would say is, you know, the tough thing about stakeholder capitalism, and again, I remember I've been hearing about stakeholder capitalism since Tony Blair and the rise of new labor in the 1990s. I mean, it's, it's not a new concept. The difficult thing is in establishing and being able to explain the way that you're measuring it. Because right. at the end of the day, the reason why shareholder capitalism has been so successful is because it's super easy to measure. Everything is based on one thing, the cost of the, the, the price of the stock. And all you have to do is look at that. And so it's easy, but it's like the old story about, hey, I lost my keys. Why are you looking for it under the street light? Well, because uh, it's too dark where I actually lost it to find them. So I'm looking for them over here. People are focused on shareholder capitalism just because it's convenient and easy to understand. But if you're able to make stakeholder capitalism easier to understand, whether it's by having a measure like number of good jobs created or amount of carbon sequestered or what have you, then I think it becomes a lot easier to tell people here, here is one of the stakeholders we're serving and here's how we can tell that we're serving them well, rather than just wishing that we did. Absolutely. And in your previous book, The Alliance, which I have not had the pleasure of reading yet, you cover this sometimes tenuous employer-employee relationship. So you mentioned, um, you know, kind of thinking, thinking, thinking differently about the stakeholders, um, being responsible, being responsible with self-regulation. And now this is, now you've talked, you're talking about why it's important for employers to think of their teams as allies. I mean, that seems obvious in 2021, but why is that for you? And why is it, a, why was it a, a core tenant to your book? Yeah, I think that, you know, one of the things that happens in the workplace, and I think that the pandemic sort of ripping the, the mask off to some extent, is that people always still feel this obligation to pretend that everyone's going to work at the same place forever. And this is largely because the metaphor that we've always traditionally used for companies, which I don't think is a good metaphor, is that it's a family. And I understand why people want to say their company is like a family. It's because they're like, well, you know, we love and respect each other and we want the best for each other. I'm like, that's absolutely true. But on the other hand, it's also true that families are legally permanent, right? Unless you go ahead and, and go to the courts and get emancipated or, or file for divorce, or do all these various things. The fact that you're a family is something that is a permanent state. And I cannot go and say, uh, I like to joke, I cannot say, well, you know, son, your academic performance over the past year has been declining. And frankly, your personal hygiene leaves something to be desired. So we've decided that, you know, we're moving on. And I, I'm bringing in Sanjay to take your place. I'm hoping that you'll stay on for a couple of weeks to show him the ropes and train him on what you've been doing. And then he'll take over for you. And, and we certainly wish you the best. And, and here's your severance package. We're not allowed to do that to our family members. And yet that is something that happens every day in companies. And again, it's not necessarily just because the company is deciding to terminate the relationship. I mean, we may realize, hey, in order for us to accomplish what we want to accomplish in life, we can't work with this company anymore. We got to move on and do something else. And it's doing us no favors to pretend that the truth isn't the truth. And what the Alliance is all about is saying, listen, once you admit the truth, once you're willing to be honest with each other, then all of a sudden it becomes easier to build loyalty because you can say, look, uh, I know that you may not stay here forever, but what are the things that you're trying to do in your life? And let's figure out how we can help you do them. Because as long as we're helping you more than anyone else can, obviously you're going to stay with us. But we're never going to know that if we have to pretend you're going to stay forever and you don't have any outside goals. Do you think most companies in, in your environment in Silicon Valley behave that way? Hell no. And why not? <laughs> if so it works, a, why aren't whole, they listening to you? So there's a whole bunch of reasons. And by the way, this has been going on for many decades. If you think about management theory back in the 1950s and 60s, 
Douglas McGregor very famously said, there's theory X and theory Y of management. And theory X and theory Y of management, basically there's two primary theories. One theory is that people are good and what you should do is you should try to remove obstacles from them and allow them to flourish. And the other is that people are lazy bums and you gotta crack the whip on them if you want to get them to do anything. And the fact of the matter is that as much as people like to talk about, oh yes, of course, people are fundamentally good and we're a place where they can come and flower and grow. Most people in the back of their minds have this notion of people are lazy and I gotta keep my eye on them. I mean, there's a reason why all these companies are saying, oh yeah, we need to get back together. Now, of course, the reason they're giving is, well, you know, it's so innovative that we really need to be together in order to have serendipity in order to have social cohesion and, those are all things that are technically true. But for a lot of those managers, the notion is, well, I have no idea what my people are doing and I don't trust them. And I'd, I'd like to have them where I can see them and where I can look over at them and they're gonna be afraid to do other stuff while they're technically at work. And I think that's unhealthy. I think that it's far more healthy for people to just admit the truth, which is, look, we're all just trying to make it through this world. And the goal should not be because I pay you, when you're at the office, you're only allowed to look at things at the office. You should never go, God forbid, onto the internet and read content that's not related to work. It's like, no, you, you've gone ahead as an employer and blurred the line between work and home. You've impinged on people's home. So you can't very well say, you know what? You can't do anything at work either. So I think that it basically boils down to prejudice. Uh, I think that slowly things are changing. I think that this notion of a great resignation that's happening right now is actually doing a great service. Uh, now, again, I always tell everyone, hey, they're calling it a great resignation. Are all those people who are resigning retiring? No, they're not, especially the young people who all the evidence says are the most likely to resign right now. Guess what? A 22-year-old isn't resigning because they're retiring. Well, unless they happen to get into Bitcoin you know, in 2010 or something like that. Yeah. They're resigning <laughs> to find a better job. And it's not a great resignation. It's a great reshuffling. And what employers are learning is, you know what? It's not enough to just sort of say, I pay you. Because guess what? There's plenty of other people lined up who are willing to pay people as well. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I think you you hit at the core of, of I think, what businesses need to be thinking more about. And I had a, a chat similar to this with an, the author of Elevated Economics, Richard Steele, who, who can, tries to implore companies to pay more attention to ESG in his book, simply because not only of the workforce, but also of the great wealth transfer of $68 trillion that's about to flow to, to the millennials um, over the next uh, five to 10 years. And so um, I wanna just uh, talk a little bit more about um, technology since I know and kind of sticking in your environment. Um, I know you're kind of a, you're in that world, you're funding it and you're in your new fund. Um, how do you think AI will affect change and maybe even affect impact. Do you see it as a tool for good or something that needs to be responsibly self-regulated or both? Both, definitely right. both. So, I mean, the, the first thing is in terms of a tool for good, uh, I, if you spend time and look at your daily activities, there is an absurdly large amount of your time that you spend on things that really are not the best use of your brain power and are not the thing that really bring you alive. And yet you have to do it anyways, because we just inherently rely on what I call human artificial intelligence, right? Just knowing stuff. And you know, you mentioned, hey, Chris, you know, it's, it's amazing how you have this interesting life. I'm like, that's absolutely true. But there's boring crap I have to do as well. Like for example, fundraising, I have to go into a CRM system and I have to send people reminders and say, hey, by the way, we're getting close to the end of the year and let's talk if you want to get into the fund. Now that is all a bunch of stuff that doesn't require like one one hundredth of my brain power and intelligence. No, but I still have to do it because we don't have an alternative. We don't have an AI that will do that just yet, but maybe it will. Right? There are significant chunks of our days that could be made much better with an AI. Or we can have AIs that can actually take the place of a human, uh, a human assistant, but most of us can't afford. I have the great fortune of working with people like my co-author, Reed Hoffman, who are very wealthy. Reed's a billionaire, and he has a phenomenal assistant, Saida, who has been working with him for a decade or two, and he can trust her completely, and she does a phenomenal job for him. And that's great. 
for him, for somebody who can afford to pay someone really well to make their life easier. Uh, I sadly do not fit into that category. I don't know if you have a longtime assistant you, you've had for the past 20 years or something like that. I do not. And I probably will never spend that kind of money on that. However, would, if there was an AI service, would I be willing to spend a couple hundred bucks a month on something that would really do all those things for me, that would remind me about the things I've forgotten, that would help make sure I don't drop balls that people are tossing to me? Absolutely. And so I think that there's tremendous promise to AI. But the big concern with AI, of course, is several things. The first thing is that AI is inherently biased. We're doing AI primarily based on machine learning, which means the data set that we feed into it really is what determines the algorithms and how it works. And if we feed in data without thinking about the potential for bias, if we feed in that data from a biased world, we're gonna get biased AIs. And so that's something that every entrepreneur who's working on AI needs to actually stop and think about. And you know, again, the early days people didn't, they, they were just trying to get it to work. But we've now gotten to the point where it's irresponsible if you don't think about that. Uh, the other thing about AI is that it's going to cause tremendous dislocation in the markets. I mean, there's tremendous amounts of work that is basically human artificial intelligence. And all that work, I mean, like things like accounting and routine legal work, is that always going to be done by human beings? Not clear. People are like, oh, no, robots will never replace these things. I'm like, oh, robots have never replaced in the past. There's no guarantee they'll never replace them. And so I think that there will be tremendous dislocation. There will be a need to, for a huge number of new jobs. There's going to be people who are going to need to be reskilled and all these things. And that's going to be a society-wide challenge, not just something that individual companies have to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And, and when thinking just about having more time, kind of having more, you know, whether you offload your, your emails or your fundraising or and we're in the same boat, so I know how much time that takes. Um, I think it does open up space in your life to think about more impact. The feedback that I get from the good your money can do is it's so overwhelming. I've got my children, my family, whatever it may be, my work. I've got all these things to think about. And how can I possibly think about the impact and the good that my money is doing? I'm right. also on, you know, I'm on autopilot with my financial advisor and I don't know if they're providing me with the right option or not. But I think the key to that is, I mean, I, I'm, I'm an efficiency geek and I, I, you know, I try my best to use AI wherever I can. But I think the key to that is really opening up the space to be able to define your values, recognize what, what's important to you, know what you own and make some changes. Um, and bring more impact into all areas of your life. Um, so I'm really glad that you kind of pointed out the how AI will also help us. And you, you said in the beginning of this conversation, Google is now telling us how much carbon uh, each flight will, will, will take and you know, how carbon intensive each flight is. There is an artificial intelligence algorithm behind that that is learning, I think, along the way and is helping us have more metrics. We do have a question, another question about measuring things um, as a way to make stakeholders and shareholders come along, the way, come along with us to buy into this kind of paradigm of impact as being important. Um, so, I mean, I, I wanted to use that same example because I do think that, you know, there are tech companies out there that are putting forth examples for us to conveniently latch onto to think more about, oh, I'm flying. What's the carbon intensity of yeah. that flight? You know, automatically in our in our brains, like what seat am I in? What's the carbon intensity? Um, but what are some other examples of that that maybe you've seen? So one of the things that I thought was particularly interesting, and again, carbon is a, a great example of this. I'm gonna push a little bit further, which is, one of the uh, one of the, so I've seen a couple of companies are trying to make it so that every time you make an e-commerce purchase, it takes into account the carbon intensity. And as an option, just like you have all these other real options for, you know, let's call it an extended warranty or, or what have you, that you could just check one more box and say, purchase the offset that yep. makes this carbon neutral. And again, not everyone's going to do it. And frankly, I'm not going to do it every time. I'll do it when I feel particularly guilty or when it's particularly convenient or I get a good deal or something like that. But it will help a lot. And the other, another, uh, another example of AI is just you know something that I think is really relevant is 
what do we choose to put in front of people? This is an area where AI has really harmed us. In the world of social media, what we choose to put in front of people is whatever is gonna draw the largest reaction that's gonna cause people to take the most action, write the most comments or, or what have you. And historically, what that's meant in terms of Facebook and Twitter is whatever's gonna outrage. You. Facebook is especially bad in this regard. And I think that one of the things that we're going to need in the future is AI that acts to tamp down the bad side of human nature. And you know, there's a great story about Mark Twain, the great American author, who would read newspaper articles. Like he didn't need social media, he just read newspaper articles. He'd get angry and he'd write these scathing letters, insulting people, calling them numbskulls, saying all these things, challenging the duels, you name it. He'd write these scathing letters and he'd give them to his wife today. And then his wife wouldn't send them out. She'd put them in a filing drawer and keep them away because she knew that if he started sending these out, he'd just make more enemies, it would just cause more problems. So we need the equivalent that's going to cause people as they're typing up and saying things, hey, wait a minute, hold on for a second. Is that a good idea? If, you, if we had the old fashioned thing where you were dictating to a human being and you were actually saying it out loud, as you were saying it, hopefully it would come to you that maybe saying, I want to crush your bones into dust, you will die, I will, uh, you, will, you, you will be completely destroyed by my forces. And you might think, hey, maybe I'm going a little too hard here. But now, because you're just typing it in as you're angry at something in Facebook, it just goes out there. And so having AI start to say, let's modulate human nature here. Let's understand our natural self-destructive tendencies and try to actually uh, prop some of them up and fix them up. Absolutely. And, and, you know, one other application that came to mind um, of artificial intelligence and frankly, just tech enablement um, for us in, in our, in our um, pipeline is using um, artificial intelligence in diagnoses for lower mm. cost medical. Um, so there's the healthcare application where you can really lower the cost, but increase the quality of the healthcare visit of the patient's visit. Um, and even, you know, use it as a tool to augment perhaps a nurse or a not a fully medical doctor to be able to, um, you know, take care of that visit and see that patient and still have a good patient outcome. Um, so we've seen it across the board, even in Africa. Um, and actually, I actually think it's, it's a major part of most strategies and in blitz scaling return and, and, and business, but also impact in emerging markets. Um, there's a, a big application there. Yeah, and I think that whatever form the supercomputers that we keep on our bodies take, whether it's phones or watches, or some people are hoping it's going to be glasses. I don't know. There's probably some people who are going to put implants in, not me. I'm going to wait on that one. But whatever form those computers take, the fact is that somebody who is monitoring your health and vital signs constantly, as opposed to for five minutes once a year, is presumably right. going to be much better at catching things early and helping with prevention and nudging you in the right direction. So I absolutely am very excited about that. On the other hand, you know, it just emphasizes the issues of privacy because now all of a sudden it's not just going to be your emails that could potentially be leaked to the world. It's your vital signs, your habits. Like when you get up, I, I have a friend who, um, it's funny, uh, his uh, he 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 met a, a he met a, a new woman that they've been uh, they begin a relation a romantic relationship, and she said, "Oh, you know, I have uh, I'm in I'm in the medical field and I have these people who can analyze your uh, your sleep habits and everything like that. We go ahead go ahead and have them analyze it and put on this you know ring and wear it and we'll analyze your sleep habits." It's like, "Okay, absolutely." She's like, "Yeah, but." But uh, not just yet, because if we're going to be romantic, I don't want my colleagues knowing when I'm doing it for how long. And it's like, whoa, I never thought about it that way. I'm like, okay, all right, that's interesting. But there are these real privacy issues that we have to be uh, concerned about and actually do something about. And do you think that extends in any way to impact? So, I mean, when you are you know, truly aiming to improve the quality of life um, let's say maybe on the more social impact side, um, could there be privacy issues? And have you have you seen that at all? So I haven't specifically seen the privacy issues come up, but I can easily see how they would, right? If you think mm -hmm. about, oh, 
all these, uh, I've done a lot of work with organizations that I think are designed to help people find better jobs and improve their economic circumstances. And that's fantastic. But if you want to tr- if you want to track and prove that it's working, you have to track people's income. And you have to track, you know, what it was before and what it is now and what they're actually doing for work. And that is all a lot of stuff that nobody wants to talk about, right? I mean, that's the that's the classic thing, at least in America, there's this social norm where you don't talk about how much money you make. The side note, my friend Ramit Sethi of I Will Teach You to Be Rich fame has a new podcast out where he specifically talks with couples about money and what makes it so fascinating and unusual is they talk about something that people almost never talk about. But that's, it's one thing for people anonymously on a podcast to talk about things. It's another for there to be a giant database of all this information in the sky being used to determine whether or not impact is happening. Excellent point around privacy and impact measurement. So Chris, you, you clearly care about impact. I mean, you've brought up so many examples that, you know, are from your own life or, you know, from companies that you've worked with. And you're raising your own, your own fund right now successfully. And I think that's great. I know you can't say too much because um, you're still in raising mode, but is there anything you can say about how impact will play a role in your investment strategy? Yeah, so Blitzscaling Ventures is not explicitly an impact fund like yours. Right. We What we promise our limited partners is that we will try to make them as much money as possible. However, and some of our LPs have had this discussion with us and we reassured them. We did tell them, look, you know, we are, while we may not be an impact fund, we are definitely not a impact neutral fund or a negative impact fund, right? We will not invest in businesses, no matter how promising, no matter how much we think they're going to make money that are a net negative to society. We only want to invest in things that are going to make our lives better. And I think that that's something that a lot of people hopefully would, would actually do. Now, again, I think that people don't know in advance. Certainly there are plenty of people who invested in companies like Facebook who did never, never imagined the sort of negative outputs that would have come. Or the right. folks who originally, like for example, if you think about um, Juul and vaping, it was right. begun as a project that was explicitly by some folks who were fellow designers at Stanford not in my class, but part of the same program, that were smokers who are like, I wish we could find a way to reduce the harm that smoking was doing to us. And they designed a product that was designed to reduce the harm of smoking. But the unintended consequence was it became something that was a gateway drug for young people and teenagers, right? It's difficult to know what the consequences are going to be, but you have to be willing to acknowledge when that happens, right? You get, it's very easy, I think, and, and as you see this in fields like you know, cryptocurrencies and NFTs, there's a lot of concern right now. Hey, will it ever be the case that these things will not be a gigantic energy drain actively adding to the climate change crisis? And they may or may not. But I've noticed that people whose monetary well-being, whose wealth depends on these things being around, tend to say, oh, yeah, of course, we're going to fix the problems. Right? It's difficult to be disinterested in these things. So I think that the most important thing is to have the self-awareness and intellectual honesty as a fund to say, okay, are we making investments that we believe are going to make the world a net better? And if we make investments that start going down the wrong path, do we have the moral courage to speak up and say, you know what, this is not something we can support? And it's very easy to do that when there's no money at stake. It's hard to do it when there's a lot of money at stake. And we'll have to see how that plays out. I'm so happy to hear. And I think you gave some perfect examples of unintended consequences. Jewel is definitely one of them. And they come up in, you know, even the, you know, companies that are working in our environment and very much so off the bat intending to have a deep, deep impact, which, which Jewel arguably was. Yeah. Um, so Chris, one last question, what's exciting you about the world right now? It doesn't have to be impact related. I mean, you are an incredible, um, thinker. You have so many great ideas. Um, I think your brain just looks at things in a very unique way. And I'm so grateful to have this conversation. Um, what's, what's, what are you excited about today on December 1st? So 
there is an overall trend that I think is really interesting. I've been tracking it for a long time and I've seen it continue to play out that I'm very excited about. And it's, I think, what I call the human science, which is looking at human behavior and who we are and trying to think about it in an evidence-based way. And there are so many different parts of this that sort of come together. On the one hand, you could look at the positive psychology movement that Martin Seligman kicked off in the academic psychology field, trying to understand what makes people happy. Or we can look at it in terms of, you know, other things that are out there, like more and more people are being inspired to start companies. One of the things I saw was a recent headline. I didn't actually see the whole story because I'm too cheap to pay for it. It was a headline in the Wall Street Journal saying that actually uh, this pandemic year, because of all these people who are resigning or losing their jobs, has seen the largest increase in the number of businesses being started on record, right? Human resilience, uh, the willingness to say, you know what? It's not enough just to work for 40 years and retire. I want to do things that are meaningful to me. And we see younger generations placing a, a higher and higher emphasis on, I want to do things that are meaningful. I believe that mental health matters. And so we have this whole thing where for forever, people looked at things like emotions and, and psychology and said, oh, this is a soft science thing and it's squishy and, and it's not to be trusted and we need to be real men and, 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 and eat steak and, and drink whiskey or what have you. There's still an undercurrent of that, right? There's plenty of this bro culture BS hanging around. But I think that there's a far greater number of people who are starting to say, you know what? Let's apply the same level of scrutiny to figuring out what the best way to live is and in a way that's better for everyone, rather than just saying, let me get what's mine. So that's an overall trend that continues to excite me. I continue to see people like you going out there in the world, enabling entrepreneurs to have an impact to try to make the world a better place. And while it's very hard sometimes, given, you know, again, I, like everyone else, I go on social media and I'm looking at posts and things like that. And I'll click on things on Twitter that are trending topic. And I'll look at that and I'll suddenly be filled with this boiling anger over what's going on in the world. But I have to step back and say, you know what? That's the filters trying to present something to me that's going to get a reaction. I, I understand why these things are being privileged. I was saying that I was going to write a post calling up the obnoxiocracy. Right? I'm trying to find the right term to basically say we now live in a world where everything is determined by the most obnoxious among us, which is absurd. But that's not actually the case. That's an illusion brought about by the fact that our filter bubbles privilege those people. In fact, I think in the world, there's less violence than ever before. People know more about things like climate change and mental health than ever before. And I think that the world is on the right track. We just don't always appreciate it. That's incredible. And in my book, I write about wealth consciousness and reframing capitalism in the sense of it's not a zero sum game. Yeah. Um, I've also interviewed other leaders that have said during COVID, leaders learned how to be humans when coming to work. And that's exactly what you're saying. And um, I just, it, you know, it, it really, um, I think is fantastic to hear that from you coming from what I view to be a very, you know, Rowy environment, a very harsh environment. I know it's changing, but um, I hope that you can also help shape the reputation of the environment that you're working in. And as a VC, you know, hopefully you can, you know, stand up and make that more of a, a visible message because it is really powerful. And I always remind myself, Brene Brown works with the military. <laughs> she works with all the big CEOs, um, and you know, she she works with you know, you know, other types of people as well. And I think that um, daring to lead is where we need to go um, in the venture world, in the business world, and as, as people. So Chris, I am so grateful that you and I got to spend this past 45 minutes together. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this conversation very widely with our network um, at the Conscious Investor Online Magazine, which I founded. And um, I hope everybody who hasn't read your book goes out and reads it and uh, gets to know you a little bit more, um, actually your books. And uh, thank you again for your time. Well, thank you so much for having me on. I, I truly appreciate it. Again, anyone who wants to learn more about my books or follow what I'm doing, you can just go to chrisyeh.com. You'll generally find links to everything. And that's C-H-R-I-S-Y-E-H.com. Awesome. Thank you for that. Thank you, Chris. Have a great afternoon. 
My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me on. Have a great new year. Thank you for all the great questions as well, folks. Of course.